Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Saturday, March 11th, 2017 edition of VR News. Hope you guys are having as uh, kick ass of a weekend as I am. Movie night later with my wife. Looking forward to that. Let's start the news though with eye tracking. And in the seven months since this channel kind of went VR focused, we've talked about eye tracking multiple times. Mostly to do with foveated rendering. And I'm just going to explain that for those who don't know. Those of you who do, it's me repeating myself. But those who don't, it's going to lay the foundation of what I'm going to talk about. So foveated rendering is basically when you are looking at a scene in virtual reality with your HMD on your head. Because of head movement being the determination of what you're looking at, not eye movement, the center of the screen in foveated rendering is the one that is absolutely clear, has all the, the features, the anti-aliasing, the anisotropic filtering. As you move away from the center towards the edges, they employ the foveated rendering, which is basically blacking out every second pixel. So you gain performance by doing that because you reduce the complexity. The problem is, and thankfully human humans are so adaptable, you basically don't have to tell somebody. Put an HMD on their head for the first time and they almost instinctively know that darting your eyes around isn't going to change the scene. You've got to physically move your head. It happens so quick. Study somebody for that first time and you'll see what I mean. It's just, it's a quick thing. And of course, remember back to yourself doing that. Well, with eye tracking, that foveated rendering technique becomes even more powerful because now if you're moving your eye and looking towards the corner, the foveated rendering no longer has to be at the center. It's wherever your pupil happens to be focused. So that greatly increases the immersion, performance, etc., of virtual reality. Now, what about the rest of eye tracking? And there's two podcasts. These are the Voices of VR podcast from Kent By on Road to VR. I've mentioned these many times. I just love them. He has covered eye tracking in his last two Voices of VR. The first one, and both had to do with interviews he did at the Game Developers Conference, but the first one was with a company called Toby. And in that discussion, they stressed the need to communicate or for devs to communicate to end users that they were gathering eye tracking information. Now, we know the obvious stuff that one of the best tests when somebody rolls into the emergency room unconscious, it's shine light into the eye, see if the pupil dilates. If it dilates, the person is effectively there, quote unquote, the responsive. If there's no reaction, we got problems and you escalate. Now, Pupil dilation can also be used, and it's being studied in various sciences for things like lying, and there's a lot of stuff. We don't need to get into that here. That's also what Toby addresses, though, is that type of data would be gathered and could be mined, and people's privacy needs to be taken into account. So that was pretty cool. And his actual statement was from Toby's side, we should be really, really cautious about using eye tracking data to spread around. We separate using eye tracking data for interaction. It's important for the user to know that's just being consumed in the device and not being sent or stored anywhere. But if they do want to send it, well, then there should be user acceptance. Get their buy-in. Completely agree. The second podcast was to do with SMI's eye tracking, which we've also covered here. And I thought this one was neat because they got into some of the benefits. For example, uh, pupillary distance. So on the Rift and the Vive, how far apart your eyes are spaced ultimately determines the quality of what you see. On the Rift, it's a slider for IPD. On the Vive, it's a dial on the side, but both achieve the same thing. They reflect your IPD, your interpupillary distance. With eye tracking, that's going to be able to be done 
automatically on the fly just through eye tracking which is awesome stuff like glasses wearing glasses all of that is going to just make that that much more seamless so super excited about eye tracking they go into way more detail and i should warn you i love the podcasts but they are very technical at times so if you're new to all of this uh, i still encourage you to listen because that's how you're going to learn but just keep in mind you might have to pause a few times have google up on the other monitor and uh, type in what the hell they're talking about but really good with that said all right the next news story a bit of a uh, no shit sherlock captain obvious story that the number of vr companies in 2016 grew by 40 40 percent right most of us knew it was going to be a number around that if not higher because it was the year of launch aka the year of hype there was a lot of that right what's going to be interesting and this is this was my takeaway from this story because they talked about uh, that gaming was driving a lot of that, but education is also going to draw, uh, drive growth in 2017. But I think more importantly, it's going to be the comparative analysis that you can do at the end of 2017. You can take both sets and say, okay, did it continue its growth or have we taken steps backward? That would be meaningful because the negative press that VR was getting just before Sony announced their sales numbers, it was frequent and it was pretty damn negative and that more or less went away. There's still some negativity, but not as much as there was just before Sony's statement. So that will be the interesting thing to look at next year. Compare the two, how are we faring? And I think it's gonna actually be meaningful at that point rather than just basing it off of wow there's a lot of negative articles vr must be dying <laughs> all right next story guys three lessons from the past to create the future of vr losing my voice here one second there we go three lessons to consider moving forward number one the message of the medium Asking yourself, does virtual reality belong here? You know, in the framework of what I'm working on right now in this gamer experience. And what they talked about is the radio industry, which started in 1920, which was an era of silent films. So here you had audio over the radio. And then about half a decade to a decade later, you started having the talkies, the movies with audio and when they talk about the message of the medium that's kind of what they're talking about is keep the familiar so with those first talking movies they basically took radio dramas the format for that and over top of that willfully pasted talking movies and it took a few years to them to get away from that but it had the benefit of getting people's technology buy-in almost instantly. The same thing, and we'll get to that, that Apple has done. Whether you like them or not, marketing-wise, it's gotta be acknowledged. So lesson two, new but familiar, about how humans crave the familiar. And they uh, talk about Raymond Lowy. He's the guy behind iconic logos like Shell Oil and uh, Air Force One. He also did a lot of sketches about stuff like future cars. How would they look? And they were very grounded in the sensibilities of the day. So that car, <laughs> that Chevy or whatever it was, in the future was going to pretty much look like a 1950s car, but with wings and a jet engine on it. And uh, that's kind of what they're getting at. The Apple Newton was a device had a lot of power but because it didn't take those familiarization steps ultimately and there were other reasons it failed so that's new but familiar and then he talks about create comfort then move on perfect example they use is again apple with their iphone when they had notepad when they had itunes ibooks 
the graphics for all of those things were the familiar. iBooks, your books were stored on a bookshelf rather than a blank screen. iTunes, same thing. And there were, you know, musical instruments to convey that. And notebook was literally a spiral bound notebook. Then as the, you know, Apple iOS went forward, they gradually moved away from that and could innovate more. But it was so important that they started with the familiar. So, yeah, very cool. That technique is called Maya, by the way, that uh, Loa used. And Maya stands for most advanced yet acceptable. So, next story. VR concerts need to end ticket scalping ASAP. This, an article from Upload VR, Jamie Feltham. He starts the article with his favorite band, which he says is Pearl Jam, a concert that's going to be happening nearby. He missed the ticket sale. They basically were sold out. So he's kind of bemoaning the state of that. And at the same time, his dis, you know, despising ticket scalping that stealing the original ticket price to prey on people desperate, right? And others would argue, sorry, that's commerce. That's how it works. They're still taking a risk in buying those tickets and may not be able to sell them, but whatever. We're not passing, you know, any kind of judgment on it. We're just relaying what's happening in this story. So Jamie kind of gave in because he really wanted to see Pearl Jam went to a ticket scalp site, had everything set up, $500 locked in on probably a $150 concert for two people. But then ultimately, as it was processing his credit card transaction, he canceled. And he talks about that. He says, look, to get rid of ticket scalping, nobody should buy. But there's always going to be fans who have to see the artist who are going to make that one-time exception. And the problem is every concert has those one-time exceptions and individuals who are willing to do that. End result, it lives on infinitely, right? In perpetuity, it's going to just keep keep happening. So he talked about 360 degrees and how that could eliminate scalping. But personally, I think the real thing, until it gets really good, the real experience is ultimately going to always be the most treasured one at least until we get to a point where it's so mind-blowingly indistinguishable from reality that you're more likely to make that you know exception but in the meantime the technology isn't quite there yet but it'll be interesting to revisit that five years from now 10 years 15 years what is a 360 degree pearl jam concert are they still going to be singing 50s now yeah they'll still be singing so when they're all retired though in their late 60s just doing tours what is 360 going to look like and it's neat to speculate but it'll become what we probably can't imagine right now so next story facebook uh, also added speech recognition and we talked about the uh, Gear VR ability to do the live streaming. Well, this was another feature that they added. And uh, it was tested by the VentureBeat writer on an Oculus Rift, and it worked. The speech recognition was very basic, though, he says. And cautions, don't expect uh, Siri and, uh, you know, the other ones. If you're going to, or Alexa, if you ask, you know, who is Mark Zuckerberg, you're not going to get a response back. It's very specific to Facebook and the application. It would be neat if it was more. For example, voice attack in Elite. It can be used for games, but you could use voice attack for so much more. It is so powerful. You could essentially run your computer and everything else strictly through voice recognition, which is amazing. All right, and that is it for the news. I plan on having a weekly gaming video, uh, just like a recap video. I'm going to work on that next. And I've also looked at Dark Legion. Just need to do the editing. Hopefully have that up this weekend as well. 
I, my track record has been getting better for that the last few weekends. I've been able to do what I said I would do, which is great. All right, guys, that's it for the Saturday night. Cheers. <laughs>